Welcome, this is Natalie Pace. Today is March 28th, 2024. I am really honored to be uh, bringing you Rob McEwen. He is the chairman and chief owner of McEwen Mining. But I'm gonna brag about him a little bit because he's actually been in the business for decades. He's won multiple awards. He is an inductee in the Hall of Fame, the Mining Hall of Fame. He received uh, an award for Queen Elizabeth's Diamond Jubilee. He's a member of the Order of Canada. And he is widely recognized as an innovator in mining. Now, one of the things that we're gonna talk about today is his ambitious goal of making the first regenerative copper mine in Argentina. He's in the process of doing that. He's gonna tell us a lot more about it. I'm gonna be linking to a video where you can learn about their vision and their goals and what they're building there. And we'll also talk about the incredible stellar rise of McEwen mining stock over the past month. It's up 71%. Um, we're gonna see if that's sustainable, if the stock is still uh, undervalued, overvalued. Um, and we'll also look in his crystal ball for gold and silver prices. Of course, copper is the commodity of the future. It's used in everything from our computers, electrical conduction, electric vehicles, solar, wind, et cetera. So this is a very, very strong commodity. And of course, McEwen Mining owns 47.7% of McEwen Copper. Now that is not yet producing copper, but they are making ambitious um, you know, goals and they are making strong progress. So we'll find out the timeline for that and much more in my exclusive interview with Rob McEwen. So stick around and we'll get started momentarily. Remember, you can always watch this back, youtube.com forward slash Natalie Pace, share it with your friends. If you have any questions or comments, or if you need a link to anything, email us info at nataliepace.com. So everyone, we are now joined by Rob McEwen. As I already mentioned, he is the chief owner and the chairman of McEwen Mining. So Rob, I'm gonna ask you some questions. I'm sure you're not gonna have any trouble answering them. You've been doing this for how many decades now? Uh, too many to count. <laughs> <laughs> well, you look great, but you know, I already told, I already bragged about you, told everybody all the awards that you've won. And, I didn't tell them about Gold uh, Corp though. That might be an important thing to say because that was a, a company that you started in a micro cap and took it all the way up to, I believe what, $11 billion market cap. Am I right about that? Uh, 8 billion. 8 it, billion. It, yeah, after I left, it kept growing. Yeah, yes. And, uh, and you're essentially now doing it again. Um, I, I wanna talk both about McEwen Mining and McEwen Copper Second. But um, I think that one thing that everybody is probably excited about is that 71% jump in share price that's happened since you announced earnings. Now, um, let's talk a little bit about that. Let's dig into it. I looked at your most recent quarter and it looked like you had very robust revenue growth. Um, did it double uh, year over year? Well, what happened there, Natalie, um, it had to do with our investment in McEwen Copper. Okay. And there was a deconsolidation that occurred. So prior to, um, I guess, October, when we did a financing McEwen Copper, we owned more than 50%. And under accounting rules, you consolidate that. So all of the expenditures at McEwen Copper went on to the income statement of McEwen Mining. And we've okay. been spending hundreds of millions of dollars there. Right. So one, the expenses disappeared because we fell below 50%. And two, the asset value of McEwen Copper increased from 200 million to over 800, bill, uh, 800 million. Right. And so we realized a gain um, based on the last financing we did, which gave an implied value of 800 million. Um, wow. Yes. So a couple of years ago, I thought we should, we had the copper project and we had a precious metal and the precious metals weren't performing the way they should be. And our treasury was weak. And I thought, all right, the market prefers pure plays, precious metals, 
and a copper play. So right. let's separate it and create finance the subsidiary that holds the copper separately. And we've been able to finance that and build its value. Yeah, and you've got some pretty deep partners there. We should mention it since we're talking about it. Rio Tinto, Stellantis, right? Yeah, they're two global giants, uh, the number two mining company in the world and the number four car company in the world are um, 19 and 14% shareholders of the company. Great. And you're now, uh, and McEwen Mining is now what, 47.7% in, in the ballpark? Yes. And I'm just under 13% personally. Okay, great. Now, for those of you that are trying to calculate the share price value of McEwen Mining, I was looking at your notes and you said that $7.75 is the value of McEwen Copper alone, right? Yes, of our holdings. Yeah. So, so, so do you think that McEwen Mining is undervalued at this point? I'd or, have to <laughs> yes. of course you are, and you are the chief owner and then you're going to cheerlead for it. We are, folks, we are going to ask harder questions than this, but I think that is important to, to note. And also that going forward, you know, I was looking at your forward outlook. It looks like you are projecting a little bit of a weaker year in 2024 from McEwen Mining's precious metals. The GOs are expected to be under where they were in 2023. That's um, correct. We and can talk to us a little about that. Uh, we have two development projects. One in our uh, box complex, which is up in northern Canada, yeah. uh, we'll be driving a, a ramp down to a deposit um, where we'll be um, just reducing our production to get down to this ore body. Um, yeah. And then we expect it to be much better once we're mining that ore body because it's located right beside our mill or process plant. Right. Uh, currently, we have to move material about 25 miles. And the rock is softer. And so we can put more material through the mill. So we expect it to resume and start growing again in 25. And okay. the cost should be lower. Great. So little weak. And so is one quarter going to look a week compared to a year ago? Q1? Uh, probably a little bit softer, yes. Um, okay. We, we gave guidance. We'll probably make guidance, but it will be softer than last year. Okay. So um, let's talk about valuation from the number standpoint. I don't know if this is correct. And obviously it's also including some uh, one-time events with your, you know, decoupling of McEwen copper off the balance sheet, but it was looking like your price earnings ratio is eight. Is that something that's possible for McEwen Mining? And are you gonna be able to continue pro running profitability or was that one-time event super helpful? <laughs> well, I hope it's not a one-time event, but um, it won't be as strong as what we reported this past year. Um, a, a lot of that was accounting. Uh, uh, the accounting becomes very obtuse at times and. So yes. we, um, we went away, I went away for a week. And when I went away, we had earnings of $1.96. And I came back a week later and it was down to $1.15. And I went, now what happened here? And, and they went, uh, well, we found a theoretical tax we have to put in, but we're going to recover it in uh, 24. And I said, mm -hmm. well, why did you take it off in the first place? But right. so there will there will be um, a contribution from the gain we've had and our operations, the higher gold price and our lower costs are going to have all of our operations generating positive cash flow. Now, you have always been um, very bullish on gold prices and, you know, a lot of gold bugs have really suffered over the past decade. Right. Gold was one of the worst performing okay. assets. Um, what do you think about it going forward in a world where we are seeing these really, I would say, unsustainable debt levels? I mean, we see a lot of concern. Um, some people, you know, are worried that, you know, uh, currency will become worthless and it's, that would traditionally push people into gold. But um, we're seeing uh, maybe competition from crypto. What is your crystal ball showing about 
maybe the coming year and the coming decade for precious metals? I believe they're going higher, Natalie, and there are several reasons. One, the debt loads that the um, Federal Reserve put on and the government's put on and many other countries around the world. Um, the period of very low interest rates caused a lot of people to speculate. And with yes. interest rates coming up, there'll be some assets being sold to cover the debt. But I think the bigger issue is that the dollar since 1974 was a petrodollar in that the world, petroleum is one of the biggest commodities purchased in the world. Everybody yeah. needs energy. Right. And so from 1974 forward, the um, Washington made a deal with Saudi Arabia that they would protect Saudi Arabia and the House of Saud. And in exchange, all the oil that Saudi Arabia sold would be sold in dollars. And then OPEC came along and all of the producers agreed to do that. Now, a couple of years ago, when Russia invaded the Ukraine, Washington put sanctions on Russia and basically confiscated all the money that they had held in the American banking system. Mm -hmm. And so that sent shockwaves through the Middle East and elsewhere in the world going, wait a minute, could America do that to our bank accounts? So since that time, two, three years ago, you've seen the formation of what's called the BRIC nations, Brazil, yes. Russia, India, China, South Africa, and they're using their currencies to buy oil with. So everybody had to buy dollars in order to buy oil. Now there's a growing number of people that don't, or countries that don't need to buy dollars, and that's creating a weakness in the dollar, and that's lifting commodity prices. And you're seeing record buying by central banks of gold. And we haven't seen this type of buying in almost 50 years. So I think you have to follow what the central banks are doing. They're mm -hmm. getting rid of the dollars and they're buying and they're replacing it with gold, which is a time-honored way of holding your wealth. So I think it's going higher. So what do you think about the competition of crypto and uh, even nations with their own you know, central bank reserve um, cryptocurrency? I, I have to say I was behind the mark when cryptos took off. I remember doing an inter interview with Forbes uh, some time ago when crypto, when Bitcoin was 100 to $120 an ounce. And I, yeah. said, and I thought, well, I don't really know anything about it, but if it became accepted, like it'd be similar to prisoner of war camps where chicken bones or cigarettes were accepted as currency. So if they accepted it as currency, it would go. But Never in my wildest dreams that I ever think it would get to the type of numbers it's trading at today. And yeah. it, it's become a method to move money around the world a lot easier than moving a bar of gold. Yeah, yeah. And I think that, um, you know, anyway, we could talk about it more. I want to stick to uh, and actually move into copper, which is an essential uh, commodity that, you know, we use in so, so many things. Yes. Um, you okay? Do you have any last words on McEwen mining before we shift into McEwen copper? Well, um, in the last 19 months, we're up 224% um, from the beginning of September 22 to the close yesterday. Yeah. Um, we have, there are three elements that comprise the value in McEwen mining. One are holding in the copper. Uh, two is a ro royalty portfolio, and three is our precious metal assets. And I we have a high and low range, and it's ranging from eight dollars a share up over thirty dollars a share. Um, and there's some value points we measure off. The largest um, component of that value is the copper. And there, there are several copper projects in the same province in Argentina as our property. And they one was bought for half a billion dollars and the other has a 
uh, over $2 billion market cap. And we have a lot of attributes that make it, I think, equally attractive. We're at a lower altitude, closer to power. We're a larger resource. We're a lower cost projected. Um, and all of those make me think that our copper asset still has room to grow. Um, our gold and silver assets are starting to form the way they're supposed to. And so we would, I think we can go start climbing back up in terms of relative value. And the portfolio, um, we have a conservatively valued at 35 million or about 70 cents a share, but we have a one and a quarter percent royalty on our copper project that is projected to produce, generate about 18 to $20 million a year for over uh, 27 years. Um, but we value it at $35. So I think there's room there. And I, I have a very positive outlook for gold, silver, copper. So yeah, Let, let's talk a little bit more about copper. And I just want to give people expectations on it. At this point, when do you, I mean, I saw that you were aiming for a feasibility uh, study 1Q 2025. Am I right about that? Correct. Yeah. So do you have a timeline yet about when you might be producing or is everything really still permit dependent? Tell us the process of getting to the point where you actually start booking revenue. You won't see production until late 29, early 30. Um, the feasibility study, once it's completed, then there's about a year of engineering um, mm -hmm. to be done. And then you have a couple of years to build the mine and then you're in production. And at that point, um, it's a two and a half billion dollar project that is expected to pay back, or at least the preliminary estimate suggests it will pay back in just over three years. It'll run for 27 years. It'll be in the lowest quartile of the cost curve, $1.07 a pound, when copper right now is just under $4. Four, yeah. And it runs, it, we're looking at only 27 years of production, but that's only mining 40% of the deposit. So we expect this to be a multi-generational asset. And it's currently considered by mining intelligence to be the eighth largest undeveloped copper deposit in the world. And if you took wow. out the ones controlled by the majors, it's the fourth largest. So it's a large one. And I'll, I like to convert <laughs> non-gold deposits into a, a gold equivalent. And if you took the price of gold divided by the price of copper and determined the number of pounds of copper to equal an ounce of gold, right? This would be equivalent to just under a 70 million ounce gold deposit, producing an average annual production of over of about 600,000 ounces a year at a cost of under $600 an ounce, just to give you a sense of its magnitude. So right. it's a very large asset. Um, and I think in, in the market we're in, it's um, going to be looking more attractive because there's a lot of production that's going offline and creating this uh, deficit in supply. Yeah, yeah. Too bad you can't get it running in 2025 when the prices are expected to go even higher, right? <laughs> You're right. <laughs> um, let's talk a little bit about, okay, so 2029, 20, 2030, but let's, I mean, I was looking at a couple of the challenges and, you know, anybody who's ever even tried to build a house knows that there are challenges to constructing anything. And a mine, of course, has that times a billion. Let's talk first about altitude. Are we concerned about the height in these mountains of Argentina? Does that add a lot of cost or is the fact that, and we can fold in your vision for the first regenerative gold, I mean, copper mine, is the fact that you're gonna have the mining camp up there um, and solar powered and all of that, is that, is that how you're solving that issue? Well, altitude, um, it's between, 3,100 and 3,600 meters. So think of 10,000 to 13,000 feet. Yeah. So clearly, if you're coming from sea level and you go to 10,000 or 13,000 feet right off the bat, 
you might gonna, faint. You're going to be short of breath. <laughs> you might faint too. Um, but you acclimatize to it. Yeah. Uh, we are planning to build accommodation that takes into account um, issues of elevation and 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 um, being the productivity of the workforce. Um, yeah, what we're putting forward, I um, would be a, a very different model than the the conventional compar comparable size mine that it currently exists for copper. And it's, you have special concerns. One that you mentioned earlier on, you have to get a permit, um, environmental permit, and that has to be approved by the community. Right. So you want to take as many things away that are concerns that the population might have about a mine. So I, I, I liken it to how does the mining industry and how do we Uberize our mine? You know how Uber decimated the taxi industry by, by making transportation much more comfortable, predictable, and without complaints. So I feel the mining industry be, industry should be doing that as well. And what we did um, two years ago, I brought in an architect who's considered the Steve Jobs of green living building space. Wonderful. And said, he said, sit down with my engineers, my project managers, and senior management, and help us redefine mining. Because mining is in a desperate need to be redefined. It has such a negative reputation among so many people. So we looked at it and said, well, if we built a conventional copper mine, we're going to be using a lot of power. We're going to be producing a lot of tailings. Yep. And, and I looked at the tailings dam drawings and it would, it would be 300 meters high. It'd be almost a thousand feet high in a valley that is in a seismic area. And there's a tributary to the main river going through the capital city. And I said, this is a non-starter. Um, yeah. So we switched to a heat bleach process. So there are no tailings. It uses less than a quarter of the water. Um, because we, we were able to get a contract for 100% renewable electricity generated by hydro, solar, and wind from um, a major power company in Argentina, the fleets will be electric. And so we're starting off... Um, with a very low carbon signature. And then we're building accommodation that, well, think of a very long, it almost is a greenhouse, but it's taking inspiration from the Incas and it's terraced inside. We're growing our own produce to cut down on transportation, treating our own uh, wastes and that. Um, and there'll be hanging gardens. There'll be a, very comfortable setting. Um, and as I said, 100% powered by renewable. And well, I want to put a hotel in the midst of this because it's really, it's very striking countryside. It's very stark rain yeah. shadow. But, you know, at night you can look, you, you feel you're, you can almost reach up into the sky and pull down the stars if you yeah. want it. Yeah. Uh, and and by the way, you are going to have people that have to come up there from other executives, uh, managers, you know, I mean, the, the hotel can probably get use other than just even hopefully tourism. But I want to tell everybody, we're going to link to a video that takes all of the words that Rob has just said and puts it into a visual vision for you to watch. And I do encourage you to watch it. Um, you know, I sent over some of your stuff to a CEO friend of mine. And he's like, well, is he gonna be able to compete with Chile and Peru? Um, is this a competitive advantage or is it adding cost? And I wanna put that question to you. Do you feel, A, that, um, that the, the numbers are there, that even with renewables and all the vision that you have for the regeneration and the wastewater treatment and all of that, that it's still um, low cost and, I'm, I'm hearing from you, and you've got to verify this, maybe I'm off, that you think this might actually be a competitive advantage because if your community is with you, then the permitting process is going to be more smooth. 
the industry has to change. I mean, the world's moving against it. And so in order to get social license, we have to uh, be much more responsible relative to the environment. Uh, when we, we did our preliminary economic assessment, updated it, and we released it last June. So the costs incorporated all of the features we're featuring that are different than other mines. And so we have a pretty good sense of what it's going to cost. And I'd say that's the price of being able to build a mine tomorrow. Okay. Um, so, and in terms of cost, it projected, Goldman Sachs did a study of projects around the world that are to be built. And ours was calculated to be in the lowest cost quartile. So producing copper at $1.07 a pound, and that's including all the cost to build this infrastructure that some people will say, well, it's too fancy. It's, And I said, you have to attract talent. And right now the mining industry uh, is suffering from an acute shortage of talent. There has yeah. been a precipitous decline in students going into schools of engineering and geology. And at the same time, at the other end of the age spectrum, you've got large numbers of people entering retirement age. So it, there's going to be a battle for talent. And so why not make your place as attractive and as comfortable and as safe as, as can be and use that as an attraction for getting the best people to work there? Okay, I'm going to throw in something else that I think could be a headwind. Uh, we have to talk about it. And again, I just want to, you know, really punctuate that I'm building the first regenerative copper mine. I want to stay at that hotel. So I definitely want to come and see it and feature it as well. It looks beautiful. And as it's getting built, I want to see it. Um, but let's talk a little bit about South America, because we've seen other copper mines that have run into problems with uh, pol politicians, but also even corruption. So, you know, not so long ago, Sociedad Chimica y Minera uh, ran into a lot of corruption issues. I think they had to can their CEO, a lot of things like that. And some CEOs, other ones that I've talked to, um, you know, in industries that service the mining industry, they're saying, you know, it's almost a cost of doing business there. So can you talk a little bit about you know, the politics, the how you plan to navigate and work with Argentina, which has had a lot of political upheaval, and maybe even you're facing some headwinds right now. Well, there has been problems in the natural resource sector. The biggest recent one was in Panama, first quantum, and the government just basically shut it down. Um, in Argentina, they elected a new president. Um, Javier Millet, and he is very much a libertarian. He's an economist, and he came in, and he was campaigning. And uh, when he's on the podium, he was brandishing a can uh, chainsaw and saying, "We're going to cut out the bureaucracy. We're going to get rid of the foreign exchange controls. We're going to reduce the taxes. We're going to encourage foreign foreign investment." Now, that was all his rhetoric. Um, he doesn't, he didn't have a large political base of support. So when he put his first bill through with about 300 revisions, um, it got rejected. But okay. the, the IMF came along and said, we like what he's saying and we'll lend you more money. The patrol, uh, Chamber of Petroleum Producers in Argentina said, if you change those laws, the tax rate and foreign exchange, we'll put 15 billion a year in to the country and we will, you will move from a deficit to a surplus. He has posted his first quarterly surplus since elected. Wow. Um, and it, it's, um, it remains to be seen if he can get it through, but he's winning marks among a lot of the outside whether he convince that um, Argentina's is sleeping beauty and he's the prince coming along to kiss and awaken the princess. Uh, because once Argentina was, you used to hear the expression, as rich as an Argentine. 
you don't hear that anymore. 40% of the country is under the poverty line. So, and there's a high rate of inflation. Um, yeah. So it, it is an environment that leads to people trying to take things out of your pocket. Um, but they are, mining is a very high paying industry. It's very capital intensive. It generates all sorts of secondary and tertiary industries and businesses. So if they can execute on what he's hoping to deliver, um, Argentina could turn around um, between its neighbors, Chile and Peru, produce 40% of the world's annual copper production. Right. With the copper discoveries that have been made in Argentina, including our own, there is a chance by, by probably the mid 30s that it could be producing 13% of the world's annual copper production. Wow. Now, if you combine that with Chile and Peru, those three countries would be producing more than 50% of the world's annual copper production. That would be very equivalent to the Saudi Arabia of the oil industry. This would be, um, they would have that type of power in the marketplace. And and we have to note that Goldman Sachs has called copper the new the new oil. Yes. yes. Yeah. So this is. Do you have any crystal ball on where copper prices will be in twenty twenty four and twenty twenty five? I'm reading reports. Um, ah, okay, okay. I know, and there are conflicting things based on how slow the economy goes, right? Yes, it's Doctor Copper. Um, it's often used as a predictor of where the economy is going. Mm. <laughs> okay, well, Rob, I'm going to give you uh, the last word. And I want to thank you again for your time and definitely keep me posted on the progress of the first regenerative copper mine. That's exciting. Uh, uh, it'd be my pleasure to invite you down to the opening of the hotel or be even before that to see yeah. this, this fabulous place. Um, I think people should have exposure to gold, silver, and the metals, I think the metals are going to perform well. And there are a number of companies out there. Um, as you asked earlier on, do I think it's undervalued? Yes, I do think McEwen Mining is undervalued. We have good trading volume on the New York Stock Exchange, half a million to a million shares a day. Um, we're coming off a bottom. We, we, we were, our share price was pummeled between 2018 and 2022. Yeah. Uh, um, so I just see us. We're on the road of a redemption. Yeah. The period before was the road to hell. And um, so I, I just think there are a lot of things that are turning for us in a very positive way. Um, so I just ask your readers to take a look. Um, I have $220 million invested personally. I take a dollar a year in salary. I own 17% of McEwen Mining, 13% of McEwen Copper. Okay, and, and full full disclosure, folks, I own McEwen Mining as well. So, yeah, I I am a believer in um in Rob. Basically, I know it's it's interesting because you know we had we did an interview at the low in twenty twenty, and um the one thing I think that readers and viewers may not know about you is that you do tell it like it is. Now you've always been a bit of a gold bug. You thought that gold might hit five thousand an ounce, and of course we've been waiting for that for a while. But at the same time, you know, you don't really blow smoke. You know, you don't really, like when you were going through it, you were telling us what was happening. And, um, you know, so I, I believe you when you say you're going to build the first regenerative copper mine. I don't think that that's just a beautiful visual uh, video that you created there. And I also know, you know, from your support of our Earth Gratitude Project. So thank you for what you're doing for the industry. And um, and thank you guys for joining us. So again, remember, you can watch this back at youtube.com forward slash Natalie Pace. And thanks again, Rob. Thank you, Natalie. Pleasure, as always. Bye now. Bye now. Bye.